What's up guys, Sean the Bro here, and today we're going to be going over another episode of the Blueprint Only Input Buffer Tutorial Series. In this episode, we're going to be going over charge frames. So we have this in the fighting game, and even though this Blueprint Only Input Buffer Series can work outside of the fighting game, I'm going to give you that example. So in the fighting game, we can hold left or right or, or back, respectively, depending on what direction our character is facing, and we can charge up a move, and then when we perform other inputs we can then execute an action or a command. That's essentially what we're doing here today. So if I go to my base character BP, you can see some logic here. And I am going to take a look at this right here. So we have charge times, and these are attacks that are chargeable attacks. So I can charge up my standard attack and tells you how long I'm holding it and when I release it. So you see how that works. And then what I can do is require a specific or a certain amount of frames to be held as a minimum so if I don't hold it for that time, then I can't execute the action. If I hold it for longer than the time, I can execute the action unless it has fallen out the maximum range of the input buffer. As you can see, I don't have an animation tied to it, but if you look in the top left corner of the viewport here, you'll see that blue text that says Command 3 executes. When I release, if I press it and release it, as many times as I press it, you're never going to get that text to print. But if I hold it, then release it, I can get it to print. Okay? And you can use all your standard logic that we've shown in the other episodes if you want to bind this to an attack or, or an actual action and an animation so you can see it more clearly than just the print string. But as long as the print string is firing, we do know that we are performing the logic correctly. If you want to get caught up in the series, I'll link you to this playlist in the top right corner right here. This is the third person tutorial series. So this is what you're going to do if that's what you're going to watch. If you want to see everything that we've done to get this entire result here, not just the input buffer stuff, but the entire series. Alternatively, if you only care about the blueprint, only input buffer logic, I'll link you to the first episode right here in this iCard in the top right corner. I also want to take a moment and give a huge, huge thank you to all my Patreon supporters and YouTube membership subscribers. Thank you guys so much for all the love and support you've given me for these tutorial series throughout the years, for everything. I really appreciate it. I'm really grateful. You all being as excited as I am about these episodes makes it really enjoyable to put them out week after week, so thank you so much. All right, now let's go ahead and get started. So today... As I said, it's blueprint only input buffer, so we're not going to be doing anything in the code. We're going to need our base character BP, and we're going to update two of our structures that we already have, and then I'm going to add another structure as well. Let's start off with the structures because they're easy. So if you follow the other blueprint only input buffer series, you should have a structure called f command info, f command input, and f input info. Today's episode, we're going to need to change f command input and f input info. We don't really need to change f command info for anything. You technically could make some changes in here to add some booleans to see if they're a chargeable command or not, but it's honestly not required, and I do not do it. I only alter f command input and f input info. So these two right here. You can start off with either of them. We're going to go into f command input first. Now, previous in the series, this was only a type and a status. I've also added a required charge frames integer. And so this is going to be how many frames are required to be held for this action to be considered true. In this case, this is an F command input. Remember the difference between F command input and F command info? F command input is an individual input of a command. So a command could be backward forward punch. F command inputs make up every input in that command. So there would be three command inputs in that example, a backward, a forward, and a punch. You can see this by looking at your command list and seeing that in command one, I have two inputs. These are both F command inputs. So each individual input can require charge. This is so some actions may need to only charge one direction, or you may have to charge two buttons to trigger a command. It's entirely up to you. Basic thing we have to do here is add a variable 
call it required charge frames, make it an integer, because we're going to track the frames in integers. And this is what needs to trigger the command, but we also need to know how long the player has held or charged an input. And so because of that, I also need to go to F input info, look at our logic here, and I'm going to add a charged frames. Okay, so required charge frames, and then charge frames. So if you add another variable to f input info, call it charge frames and make it an integer, we'll now know how long the player has held the input and how long they've been charging it for. And we know how long the command requires this input to be charged for. There's one other structure that I've actually added today, so this is entirely new. So if you go to add, blueprints, structure, and name it whatever you want, I called this one f charge input. Now we're gonna have three variables in this one, so you can add them right now if you want. We have input type, which is gonna be the same as the other types in the other structures. We need to know what button, what input this actually is. Now in this case, and, and the case of the fighting game as well, it's not a specific key, right? We have these inputs that are bound to different types. So I have the attack type. It could be multiple buttons that could trigger that attack the player might change their controls. And so the keys, the buttons, they could change, but it's the actual input type. So it's attack, jump, run, whatever it is. The next thing I have in here is charge frames. And I know it looks very similar to the charged frames in F input info. So let me explain the difference. F input info is the inputs that get added to the input buffer. So anything I press is gonna go in the input buffer. The F charge input is only gonna track inputs that have that are chargeable. We don't necessarily want to keep track of every single input, every single button, how long they've been held and when they've been released, unless that character requires us to do so for different moves. In this case, I only have one chargeable move right now. Okay. So the only thing I have here is the ability to hold a button and hold it for a number of frames. And if I execute it at the right, you know, if I if I release it at after the right number of frames it performs the action. So these are slightly different. We still need to keep track of the charged frames in the input buffer, but this is going to keep track of a little bit more and it's also gonna be more specific so we can debug it and test it. Technically you don't need F charge input. You could just use F input info and fiddle it and get it to work. But F charge input makes it a lot easier for us to do many things that we're gonna be doing with these charge inputs. So, like I said, charge frames, and it is an integer. Then we also have a Boolean at the bottom, and I call it is holding input. This is just so we know when we press it, if we're already holding it, we can add to the charge frames. Otherwise, we have to start incrementing the charge frames. But alternatively, if we are holding it and we release it, we want to stop and reset the charge frames because it is no longer being charged. Once we're done with our structures, we can go ahead and close them or you can keep them open if you want to mess with them. But that's what I got for all these structures. I'm going to close them because I won't need to go back into them. The rest of our logic is going to be in the base character blueprint today. So the first thing I'm going to do so we don't forget is actually add a command that would work for this, even though the rest of the logic isn't set up. Don't want to skip that part. We want to make sure we have a command that way we're not trying to execute some random action that we haven't actually filled out yet. So if you go to your class defaults on your base character BP, scroll down to your command list, you may have more commands than I do. You may have the exact ones. I just overwrote my third command because the other ones are in use. So command two, I was using some directional stuff. Uh, so you could see moving forward, moving backward, left, right. Command one, I was just using two buttons that were presses. So I don't need either of those, but command three, I'm using for today's episode. So I'm using a charged input. So I've added, if you don't have another command that you wanna use, add another command. And then I've added this one here. I've called it command three. I've added one input to the input required to perform this command, opened it up, and here it is. So I have the type of attack. And in this case, I only have one button. You can definitely pair this with other inputs. But for right now, I'm just testing to make sure this actually works. And so I have the type of attack, and then I have a status of release because I want it to fire upon release of that input that I was charging. 
in this case, assuming I'm charging my attack by holding the attack button for as long as I can, then upon release, I'm going to trigger it so the status makes sense to be re release. Now, for the required charge frames right here, you can put whatever value in you want. By default, after adding those charge frame variables, they're going to be zero on all your other inputs that you already have in your other command. And you can leave them that way if you don't want them to be charged at all. So that's probably the case for most of our commands and our command inputs. So you only change the ones that you want to be able to charge or, or have to charge to be able to perform an action. So I changed it to 60. We're typically running as close to 60 FPS as we can. And so 60 charge frames is essentially one second. And then there's a max frames between inputs, which is part of the overall command. So it's how distant the inputs can be and still be considered part of the command. Now we set this up in a previous episode. Just know if you're gonna have more than one input here, if you're not just gonna have the one input with the released and the number of charge frames, you do have to make sure that this does not get cleared past a certain point, right? So if this takes 60 frames to charge, whoops, I don't want this to be one because if it's one frame between inputs, well, I can't even charge it fully before we get to that. In a one input, command here like like we have in this example it won't matter because there's no frames between inputs there's only one input that we're looking for so once we reach that input we can fire it but if you have multiple just make sure that you do give yourself a buffer you could make it pretty big for the charges as well like if you want to let them charge over 60 frames they charge five times as much and then if they don't do anything after that it's going to reset so just keep that in mind i put it to 60 as an example but again since it is a one input command, it could be one. Okay, so this looks good. I have my command and I'm ready to go. All right, I'll keep that open for you in case you want to look at it anymore. And now we're going to add quite a few things today. Now the variable we're adding is a variable I called charge times, and it's going to use our new structure that we have. F charge input. Okay. So if you make a new variable, call it whatever you want. Charge times is a good name for it. Find your new structure. Remember, I called mine F charge input right here. Then after you compile and save so you can edit the value, you can go to the details panel and you see F charge input is here and it's got this single pill shaped object next to it. Make sure you change that and make it an array right here, the, the three by three of squares. Now, once you do that, we can hold all of the inputs that we know we have to track. This is what's important here, because again, like I said, we might not want to track every input. It's going to take more memory to do that. Thus, our performance will be slightly worse if we're tracking all of our inputs. You probably wouldn't notice it, especially not at this level. But as you get into more advanced stuff with it, tracking all the inputs and all their frames could get a little messy. So we only want to track the inputs that are relevant to our character if possible. If they're all relevant, that's fine. If they're not though, that's where the charge times really shines and that's why we made that F charge input structure. So for me right now, I'm only tracking the one that I actually need, but you could add as many elements in here as you want. So after you make this, you already compiled and saved so that you can make it an array, you will be able to add default values. If you don't have any here, you just click the plus, but I've already got one, so I don't need to do it, but add as many as you need and then set the defaults to whatever you want. So in this case, I want to track the attack button. So that's the input type that I'm going to choose attack. I'm not going to default the charge frames or the is holding input because they're going to be set as I do things or as the player does things in the game. But I do want to make sure I'm tracking the attack input. Again, add it for all the ones you need. This is the only one I need. This can be specific to each character. So right now I'm in base character BP, so all children are going to inherit this value by default. But that's the beauty of having this parent-child relationship in classes, and you can change that and then make it unique for each class. So if each character is different, then this array can also be different. So let's go to our event graph now, if you're not already there. 
you can go over to your functions section as we do and add more functions. So this time we're going to make three new functions. We're going to have start tracking charge times, reset charge time, and determine charge frames. So these three new functions, I'm going to go over all of them, but they're pretty self-explanatory. So start tracking charge times, meaning we've pressed an input and we want to start tracking how long it's being charged for. Reset charge time means the button has been released. And so we no longer want to keep track of how long it's being charged for. We want to reset it back to its default state. Determine charge frame. It determines how many frames this input has already been charged. So again, in the case of our attack, that's that value you saw when we were playing the game. So if I play here, I click base character BP. And I'm holding this attack button, you see that the charge frames in the bottom right there is moving up and up. That's how we're going to be able to grab that value because we're going to see how long we've been holding this input. When we release it, it resets, goes back to zero. Everything converts as it should. All right, so make your three new functions. And I'm going to start with start tracking charge time. So once you make this function, it's going to bring you into it right away. You can either click on the initial node or click on the function in the list. And we're going to need an add an input parameter. So on this function, we need to add an F charge input. Again, we're using that new structure that we made. So you can click plus to add an input parameter. I've called it input to track, but it doesn't matter what you call it. That's just the name that we're using. And it is the input we're going to track on how many frames it's been charged. So that's why I called it that. For the type, you're just going to grab F charge input, just like the array we made. All right, what we're going to do is we're going to loop through all of the elements in our charge times array, and then we're going to grab the corresponding values, and we're going to set them to things that we need to set to keep track of so we know that we're charging this input. All right, so we are going to grab our charge times array. Like I said, get this. We can drag off of it and grab the length. This is going to get us how many elements are in the array. Now, remember that length is not, it doesn't use the same indices. So it's not starting at zero. It's the actual number of elements. So even though we only have index zero in charge time, we actually have one element in there. So we need to do length minus one if we intend to loop through this because we need to make sure that we don't go out of bounds and cause a crash. Okay, so that's what I've done here. And we're going to do a standard for loop. You could do a for each loop, like you've seen me do a ton, but the problem with this is for each loop does not actually return an element that you can change right then and there on a structure. If we change an element off of the for each loop, we're changing a copy. A lot of times this can be okay. In this case, we need to change the actual element within the charge times array, not a copy. And so one way to do this is to do a manual for loop and grab the specific index using a reference. It's okay if it doesn't make sense yet, we're going to do it. So after you get this, you can just right click anywhere and type for loop. You want to find the regular for loop. Now this works just like a code for loop. So you have a first index and a last index. The first index is going to be zero. We're starting at the first element in the array and the last index is going to be charge times length minus one. So I plug that in here. Now we have loop body and index. We want to use the index that we're on. That's the index of this array and we want to get that index. So we type get after dragging off of charge times. You have get a copy and get a reference. We want to get a reference because we want to be able to change things on this structure. Okay. You can tell it's a reference because you'll have a diamond as opposed to a circle. So if you do get a copy, you'll see the copy is the circle, the reference is the diamond. We don't want the circle, we want the diamond here. So I got it and I passed an index for the variable. All right, now we need to break this so that we can grab the variables inside of it. Okay, because right now we have this F charge input structure, but we don't have the values inside. So we can just do a simple break. 
to get this node that you're seeing here. Now we only need the input type for now. So if you'd like, you can hide the other inputs and I'll show you how to do that in a second. But you're going to want to grab it from both the get reference that we had and break that. And then also the input to track that's passed into this function should also break because we're going to compare input types. All right, so if you drag off your input to track and type break, that's charge input. I put them right, you know, up one above the other, one below the other. That way they're right next to each other and I know where they're at. So I have these two here. Now what we're actually doing, because I haven't explained that part yet, other than looping through the charge times, is we're going to check, when we press an input, like I said, we are going to start tracking it. So we're going to know what input we pressed. We want to check and see if it belongs in this array. Okay, our charge times array, remember? Right now we only have attack. So if I press jump, well I have no reason to start tracking the jump because it is not in the charge times array. So we are going to check input types between the input pressed and the inputs within the charge times array. And if they match, we can start tracking them. Otherwise, we just ignore them. So you drag off your input type, type equal equal or equal enum like this, and just drag each input type into it. You should get it to look like this. At this point, if you want to clean it up, you can actually hide the unconnected pins by clicking on these breaks. And you'll get it to shrink like that, so you're only checking the input type. But that's up to you. It's not required, just a visual thing. Drag the equals out into a branch. And only if it's true, we want to set members and F charge input. So how you do this one is you can right click anywhere, set members in. And then you search for your array, F charge input. You also can drag off the individual element and say set members and it will give you the structure. So however you want to do it, just make sure that the reference from the get is passed into the structure reference on this node, just like I have it here. Now, when you actually get this node, it may look like this by default. This is because you have all of the variables related to the structure and what we can set. There's only one we want to set here. If we set the others, we'll actually override the values, and we don't want to do that. We're only checking and setting one value here. So this is a case where you definitely want to disconnect. You want to click on the set members, open up the default category, and disconnect the nodes you don't need. We don't want to set the input type, and we don't want to set the charge frames here. We only want to set is holding input. At this point, we're starting tracking, so we want to set it to be true. So we check it. And there you go. So that's how start tracking charge times work. Now, we can exit out of that one. We'll figure out where we call it in a second. But let's set up the rest of our functions. So we also have a reset charge time. So you can go ahead and go into reset charge time. And the good news is it's almost exactly the same as our start tracking charge time. So you can literally click on reset charge time, add your input parameter of input to reset, which is an F charge input. And then copy your entire start tracking charge times and paste it in here. Then hook everything up as you, as you would, right? So just to go over it real quick, this is all the exact same. We're looping through our charge times we're grabbing the value at this index in the charge times array. Then we're breaking it to grab the individual variables off of it. And we're using the input to reset and breaking that. At this point, we want to only check if the input types are equal because we're going to use reset charge time to reset any frames that have been charged when that input is released or potentially if it's gone past the maximum value. So we already have the input or the key that the user would, that they have pressed. And so we can check the input type against the input type in our charge array. Again, you can feel free to hide unconnected pins or go in and disconnect these other pins that you aren't using. Check if the input types are equal to each other and bring it out to a branch. If they are equal to it, we want to set members in F charge input 
again, making sure that the reference, the struct reference, comes from the reference of the get from the for loop. This time, we don't need input type still, but we do need charge frames and is holding input because we want to reset the number of charge frames as well as set is holding input to be false. Make sure you have both of these connected, reset it to zero and false. And that is reset charge time. So see, that one was pretty painless after we did the first one because they're very similar. Now we have one other function that we made and we need to take care of, and that is determine charge frames. If you haven't already made it, go ahead and make it now. This is going to have an input and an output parameter. So it's going to have an input parameter of input type. All right. So input type is an E input type, just like we have in our other structures. And uh, just like we had in the charge times array, how it has an input type here. Input type is just our type of input. Literally, it's if we have keys bound to attack, every key that is bound to an attack, they have the input type of attack, right? So here, what we're going to do, we're going to use determine charge frames to determine how long a specific type of input has been held. So how long has the attack button been held? That's how we can think of it. So we need to make sure we have an input parameter of input type. And then you can also add an output parameter right here. We're going to return the number of frames that it's been held for or it's been charged for. And this is just going to be an integer. We don't need it to be an integer 64 because, you know, it's not going to be able to be held that long. And if it is, well, they're holding it for, you know, days, years, <laughs> or long that may be. In which case, like I mentioned in the last episode, we can just go ahead and reset that. So regular integer will do the trick. Okay, so in determined charge frames, here's what we're going to do. We are going to loop through our charge times array. We don't have to change anything on the charge times array. So you see, we can use a regular for each loop, not the standard for loop. All right, so I'll do this above. We can grab the charge times, drag off for each loop. I want the one with the break this time. Save on a little bit of performance. We can actually iterate through this and break when we are done, when we found what we need. If you drag off array element and type break, we can of course grab all of the data that we need. This time we're going to need the input type and the number of charge frames. We don't need the Boolean is holding input. And we are going to do the same thing we did in the other two functions. We're going to check the input type against the input type that is passed into the function. Just like that. Okay, you drag this out into a branch. And I'm going to delete this because we have all this right here. And so now what we're doing is if the input type that we're trying to check how long has been charged matches an element found in the charge times array, we're going to grab the charge frames from this charge times array and set it equal to the charged frame count, which is a local variable we're going to add to this function. We're going to then return this value. That way we can add it to the appropriate spot in our input buffer. As I said with the other ones, feel free to hide the unconnected pins if you'd like to clean that up. So if you scroll down on the left hand side below variables and event dispatchers, there's a local variables, you can click the plus here to add another local variable. And I'm going to have one called charge frame count, which is an integer with a default value of zero. The reason a local variable can be good is because local variables are variables that only exist within this function. So they're good for performance and memory because once they run out of scope, once this function ends, then the variable ceases to exist. We really only need this to return the value so that we know what we're going to put in the input buffer. And thus, we don't really need to keep track of it at any other point. So assuming the branch returns true, we then grab this local variable, set it, and we grab the charge frames from the break and pass that in. At this point, we can break out of the for loop because we've actually found the input that the charge frames for the input type requested by this function. So we no longer have to continue the loop. So you can drag 
back into the break. It's a little weird because if you do that, it's just going to be the straight line and it's pretty ugly. So what you can do instead is add some reroute nodes, which you can do by double clicking on an existing line or right clicking, typing reroute node and then hooking it up to that. So that's what I did. I added some reroute nodes so it can kind of go backward in a pretty nice looking manner. And this will make the loop automatically complete. So at this point, we know the next section is off the completed node. So we can drag off completed and type return node, or you may already have one in here from adding the output parameter. And then you have to pass it the frame count, the value you want to return. We want to pass our local variable. So you can just get this and pass it in. At this point, all of our new functions are in, so it's just a matter of where we call them and what we have to do to upgrade our old logic. From here, it's pretty simple. Let's go to perform input logic. This is basically the first step. So when an input action is detected, we then call this function with whether it was a press or a release. We set that up in previous episodes. So this is pretty much the first step when we press an input. It's going to go here and fill out the logic. We were removing old inputs from buffer at this point because we're still not using a circular buffer. So we have to get rid of the old ones that are dated. Then we were getting the appropriate, we were using the key that was passed into here and then finding the appropriate mapping. So if it's like, in my case, the one key, the one key actually is bound to the attack key. So that's the input type that we're trying to grab, attack. And we were passing it into a function called add input to input buffer. Well, now this is going to be slightly different. So let's take a look at this and I'll go over all of it. So add input to input buffer you already have in here, but you'll probably notice that you now have input info charge frames at the bottom because at the end of the day, add input to input buffer takes in an F input info structure and we added a new variable to it. It'll be empty right now. We're going to fill it out in a second. We can call all of our functions in this section and then grab our charge time appropriately. In doing this, we will also be able to then determine how many frames input has been charged. So like I said, this is where the majority of the work is going to be done. So after clearing the inputs on a press and a release, we want to, we want to do the same where we determine the charge frames on both. But on a press, we're going to determine charge frames. So we're going to call our new function here. You're going to pass in the input type that we find in the input type map for the input that was pressed to the input type parameter here. You can see I've done that for both the pressed and the released. It goes into both of them. We also use it for the name in the add input to input buffer. That's what it was being used for before. So now it's just plugged into more things. We haven't taken anything out. This function returns a frame count. So that new parameter that you have on add input to input buffer, the input info charge frames now needs to have something passed into it and it can take the frame count from determined charge frames. Okay. And that's for both pressed and released. Now the only place pressed and released differs for the charge is the function we call at the end. So after we've added the input to the input buffer, we have to determine if we should start tracking the charge times or if we should reset the charge time. So you can call your new functions, start tracking, reset charge time. You can right click on the input to track and split to get all the values, all the data. And that's how you see what I have here. Then we don't really care if we reset the charge frames or the input to reset is holding input here and either the start tracking or the reset charge time. Because if you go into those functions, you'll notice that we never use those values from the parameter that's passed in. We only use the input type. Same with reset charge time. We only use the input type. So you can leave these you know, defaults zero and unchecked, but we do have to pass it the correct input to track and input to reset. That is also going to be off of this guy, off of this find. So you see I have reroute nodes, go into the input names, come over here, go into the input to track and input to reset. 
Now at this point, you'll be able to see that you should be able to grab the correct frame count initially, or the correct Boolean of saying we're holding the input. It won't actually track all of our frames that we are holding it. It'll only do the initial operation to grab that data. Okay, so as we hold it, it's not going to update in real time. That we have to do in tick. So we can scroll up to our BP tick function, or again, if you're not following the third person tutorial series, this can just be event tick. You don't need this special tick that I have in here. This is what we had in the series prior. I've added the ends of each of these nodes to a reroute node. That way they group up. And then this is the logic I have for today's episode. We're going to do that same for loop we did in those two functions, start tracking and reset charge time. So you can copy it if you'd like. If not, you probably get the idea by now. We're going to grab our charge times array, get the length, subtract one from it so we don't go out of bounds, and then do a standard for loop with that as the last index. We then want to grab off of our charge times array, get a reference, not a copy, but a reference at the index that we are at in the for loop. We want to break that and we want to grab the charge frames from the value we found from this get. We want to add one to it, just increment it. And if is holding input is true, that Boolean that we set in start tracking charge times, if it is true, we're going to then actually set the members of this get reference. Okay, so drag get reference put in the struct reference of the set members. And we only want to set the charge frames to charge frames plus one. So we're just basically incrementing charge frames and setting it back to itself. That way we add every frame, we add one charge frame because we're still holding it. If it's false, we don't do anything, but it's reset in the reset charge time function, so it doesn't matter. Take note, we don't want to override the input type or is holding input in this structure. So you only want to have charge frames visible. At this point, your charge frames will also be visible where mine were. So you will be able to see it increasing and, and incrementing. However, you won't be able to see anything happen and you won't see your text print. So for me, remember I have in start command a print string that prints the name of my command when I performed it correctly. Well, nothing will print even if you have this hooked up because it's not we're not quite done yet. We have the correct charge logic going on. Okay, we can track if we're charging or holding an input or not. But we're not able to actually check against the required charge frames that we have in our command list here. So remember, I have this required charge frames and we have to know how many frames we should charge it for. This is handled and check input buffer for command. As usual, I'm not going to go over this whole thing because it is pretty involved and we've edited it a bunch. But there's one thing we have to do. And that's here. So as we start, we loop through all of our commands, we reset our correct sequence counter, and then we loop through every input in those commands. This array, we break and grab the type status and now we have required charge frames from we're going to grab this value and use it in a second. But as we're checking against our input buffer to see if we have the same name, so the same input type and the same input status, such as press or release, we now also have to check and see if the charge frames in the input buffer are greater than or equal to the required charge frames for this input in the command. Okay. So where we do input get and we grab the break input info, we can drag off charge frame type greater than equal to. You'll get this note here. Make sure this charge frame is up top because we want to make sure that this value is greater than or equal to the required charge frames. Okay, so then you pass required charge frames into the bottom. And it returns a Boolean. Now we have this and node here where we were checking again if we were the same type and status coming from this break. You can click add pin at the bottom right of the and node to add more ands. You can keep going as long as you want. I only need three right now, but you can just see that I've added another one because we only had two before. So add a third one and pass in the Boolean result from the greater equal. 
the rest of it can stay the same. And there you go, guys. There you have it. So now I can hold my attack button, and you can see as I press it, the charge frames go up and up and up until I release it, in which case they reset to zero. Only if I have 60 frames or higher does the text in the top left or in the output log ever print. Okay, so we can take a look at that. So if I hold it above 60 frames and release it, Command-3 prints. If I press it right away, no matter how much I press it, nothing's printing, I haven't performed the command. But if I press it, hold it above 60 frames and release it, I performed it. If I press it, release it below 60, even if it's not mashing it, right? I can get it to like 58. You see, I'm not triggering it. As soon as I go over 60, I trigger the command. So now we have a successful way to determine if we've been holding down an input or not and for how many frames. And then we can also in incorporate that into our input buffer to determine if we should perform a move or not. So anyway, guys, that is all I got for you today. So thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed, please subscribe. It does more for myself and the channel than anything else you can do. And I just really appreciate it. I want to give another thank you to the Patreon members and YouTube membership subscribers. Thank you for everything you guys have done. I really, really appreciate it. I'm so incredibly grateful, and I really love this community. So thank you so much for showing me your support once again. If you had any issues with this tutorial or any of my tutorials, feel free to reach out to me on Discord. It's completely free. There's a link in the description to get you to the community, and I'd be happy to help. Like I said, guys, that's all I got. So thank you so much for watching. I'm Sean the Bro, and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye, guys.